The first question this week is, are there any downsides to front or back loading your water intake? I drink about two liters in the morning, but in the afternoon I'm on the road slash doing stuff, so I drink another liter in 10 minutes when I get home just to reach my daily requirement. Is this okay or do I have to take my water with me everywhere I go? So I think sipping on water all day, like it's definitely a good idea. It can help with hunger management and stuff like that. Having a hydrated cell is probably good for muscle anabolism and that sort of thing. But I don't know. I I kind of think that water is a little bit overhyped and I think that people probably don't need to be just chugging water all day to grow muscle and I think that you can largely go by, hey, if I'm not incredibly thirsty and I my urine isn't like dark yellow, I'm probably fine. And as long as you do that and you have several fairly clear peas throughout the day. I tried to think of a better word than that, but then you're probably fine and you probably don't need to necessarily shoot for, hey, I have to drink X many liters and stuff like that because we're going to have different water contents from food and other things that you're having throughout the day and depending on what your day-to-day -day activity looks like and that sort of thing, it can make a fairly big difference on your water needs and your personal sweat rates and stuff like that. So I actually wouldn't really worry about it a whole lot if you're not experiencing signs of dehydration like I talked about, like thirst and your color of your urine, which is awesome to think about. Great job, Ryan. So yeah, I think that that's fine if you're doing that, but I think that you probably don't need to load water either way. So I hope that helps out there. Second question, what do you think about dieting straight through or having refeeds and diet breaks? So, you know, like I believe Menno Henselman has talked about, hey, you know, I just like to kind of diet straight through to get back to the messing phase instead of having diet breaks and refeeds. Whereas others are more so in the camp hey, these diet breaks refeeds tend to help. So let's go that route. And I think that both of them absolutely have their merits. I tend to prefer to have some sort of non-linearity, especially for longer diets. And it's not really a a physiological reason like I think that you could argue either side on are there physiological benefits of diet breaks and refeeds but I think it's more so like man after you've been dieting for four to six weeks straight a lot of people are just ready for a psychological break and I think that bodybuilders tend to self-select for tough guy syndrome, and I'm definitely in that group as well. And I think that regardless of who you are, this is something that Valentine, Valentin Tambozi talked about is, regardless of how hardcore you are, a diet will break you down mentally if you're in it long enough. And I think that having a diet break every several weeks is a decent approach. And I'm probably going to program a deload every four to seven weeks for the most part anyways. So why not have a diet break during the deload? Because I still think that, hey, could you get away with not having a full week of maintenance calories during a deload? Sorry, there's a deer out of my yard. But a full week of maintenance calories? Yeah, I think that you could kind of get away with that. But my thing is like, hey, there could be psychological benefits here. You could re, re, refuel, replenish some muscle glycogen. That could be beneficial because 
Muscle glycogen plays an important role in muscle anabolism. Like there's a, a study, 2013 study that looked at cyclists that performed bouts of cycling to exhaustion and they were either on a low carb, like 10% of their calories versus a high carb, which was like 70%. And the higher carb group saw greater rates of muscle protein synthesis and less muscle protein breakdown after, during the recovery period and throughout exercise. So carbs are important and play an important role. And I think that having those periodic days to replenish at least some glycogen is probably a good idea. So I think that for those reasons, I lean towards hey, some non-linearity, whether it's having a couple refeeds each week, I think that that can still work, or having full-on diet breaks, which is probably what I would lean towards a little bit more. I think that that's a good approach. Now, if you're only dieting for like four to six weeks, somewhere in there, then just diet straight through and get in, get out. But when you start getting to eight, nine, 10 weeks, I think that it makes sense to break that up with a diet break. Even if it means one less month of massing, I think that it's probably worth it. Especially if, you know, I think that even especially for, you know, someone that's looking to just lose some weight and then maintain that. Playing that long game and having those diet breaks are kind of like nice little, nice little pit stops to where it's like, hey, we just have to diet for like five or six weeks here. We'll take a break or not necessarily a break. We will eat at maintenance and then we'll get back to it. All right. So I definitely think dieting straight through has worked, can work, and is still a solid approach. But I do lean towards having some refeeds, having some diet breaks here and there. All right. Next question, Donna, my client, Donna. Donna, how are you doing? I know you watch all these, so I appreciate you. And for everybody that watches these, like, I really do appreciate it. I post stuff on the internet and a couple hundred people watch, so that's pretty cool. So thank you. Now, Donna asks, she mentioned that something that Meadow Henselman's has talked about again. Man, Meadow comes up a lot, but good dude, knows his shit. Is that one way for men to prevent a drop in testosterone as they age is to stay within a healthy body fat range and continue to exercise and lift? She's like, do you think that applies to women too? And, you know, I I would say I'm underread on the hormone stuff. Ooh, those forearms, man. I think it makes a big difference in your physique. Just say it. But she said, or what am I saying? I'm underread in the hormone stuff. So take this for what it is. But I think that it would absolutely make sense if the same sort of thing applies to females as they age. To maintain healthy kind of anabolic hormone levels, staying within a decent body fat range, continuing to exercise, eating a relatively decent diet. I think all those things are going to have very good impacts on maintaining those levels as you age and especially lifting weights and preventing like osteoporosis and which is like the degradation of bone and stuff like that. I think that that is definitely a good idea. So yeah, I absolutely think that logic applies to both sexes there. All right. So hope that helps out Donna. And the next question was regarding how does how might a higher carb diet be better for muscle growth or how does carbs influence muscle growth? And this is really in line with what I talked about earlier. So like that study I talked about, having a higher carb diet tends to lead to a little bit less. Now that compared 10% of your daily calories from carbs compared to 70. So a pretty drastic difference. And in that comparison, absolutely think that a higher carb, it's going to benefit muscle protein synthesis and also less muscle protein breakdown. So I think that that's a very good idea. Now, what if you compared 40% carbs to 60% carbs? Would you see that difference? I don't know. I have no idea. Good question. 
I don't know. Just because I'm on YouTube doesn't mean I know everything. But I think that it's more probable. So if I, one thing that I try to do is think in probabilities rather than in kind of like absolutes. So I would say that it is more probable for a 60% carb diet to be more beneficial for muscle growth compared to a 40% carb diet with the rest of those calories made up from fat as carbohydrates may have some of those potential anabolic effects of keeping your glycogen levels fully stocked, aiding in muscle protein balance and training performance and that sort of thing. So I think that that's probably a decent idea. And I would say that that is more kind of probable. Now, one might ask, well, what if you just had more protein instead of having more fats to fill that in? What if you had more protein? Well, considering that protein is kind of, you still see anabolic effects of protein regarding insulin response and stuff like that. Maybe that's a decent idea. Although I don't think protein will probably help with your training performance as much. Yes, you have gluconeogenesis to where you can convert protein to glucose and use it for fuel, but carbs is quite a bit more efficient pathway to that. So I still think that carbs, there's probably a better kind of mechanistic rationale for why that would probably help a little bit more. But I definitely think that when you're looking at the extremes of like 10% carbs to 70, yes, I absolutely think a higher carb diet is going to help there. When things become more moderate, I'm not sure how much that things really matter. And I would say it's probably more so a matter of, hey, what's your training look like? Do you have a good training stimulus? And how's that set up? Or what's your sleep look like? Or what are your genetics? I think those are going to have far greater impacts on your results than 60% carbs versus 40% carbs, if that makes sense. All right. So hope that answers that. And the final question. So if I had one muscle group that I would pick to be my strong point and one muscle group that I would pick to be my weak point, what would I choose? This is so easy. No, just get it. So for the strong point, it's I kind of debated it back and forth in my head, and I would actually say abs. And I know it's weird, but if I could just have like Steve Hall body fat distribution and like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something that has really like well-shaped abs, like Matt Ogus abs and Steve Hall body fat distribution, you'd be good all year long. You could be hanging out at 20% body fat and just be like, yeah, I'm on the beach chilling. You know, so I think, I think that that would be the best approach. Now that's coming from a guy that doesn't have good body fat distribution and has to be very dang lean to have like those lower abs come in and all that stuff. So it's kind of the grass is greener. You want what you don't have. But my second option would definitely be the arms, you know, come on, having just some big guns is pretty sweet. Now, the worst, if there's one muscle group to pick to be the worst, I would probably pick the hamstrings just because like, I think it's nice to see the quads. I think that even the calves, those are out in the day more. Forearms absolutely make a big difference. Arms, of course. Delts, of course, you need those. Even your neck, of course, you need that. But the hamstrings, like, yes, definitely can make a physique look better, but I don't know. I probably give the leash shits about my hip tricks. All right. So I appreciate you watching. I'll see you next Sunday.